1986 was a wild year game-wise, and 1987 is shaping up to be even better. But before we get into that, let's quickly discuss what happened in the world of tech in 1987. IBM introduced its PS2 personal computer as soon to be standard for modern PCs. And they also released VGA standard for graphics. While not widespread yet, it would revolutionize PC gaming in the coming years. CompuServe created GIF standard for images, which many many years later would become a fighting point for all sorts of Gramapolis folk. Adlib released its first sound card for PCs, that was in fact the first standalone one for the platform, and while it was a monumental upgrade over the built-in PC speaker, it still held no candle to the likes of Amiga and its sound capabilities. Some would say that C64's SID chip was as capable. It's not the case, but in the right hands it was a powerful piece of silicon. Microsoft released MS-DOS 3.3 and Windows 2.0, and more interestingly with help from IBM, OS 2 1.0, a new operating system that was supposed to take over the world. We know today that all it took was good relations between the two tech giants. Square Enix released the first installment of its now called classic Final Fantasy we're playing on NES, but the single most important event of 1987 was the premiere of the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, which not only gave us incredible sci-fi opera and Captain Picard, but also visual effects in part made on Amigas. Now, that's one hella long introduction, so not to waste any more of your time, let's jump straight into C64 games for the year. 720 Degrees is a skateboarding game with name coming from a famous trick where one does two full circles after jumping on a skateboard in the air. To win the game you need to win 16 events spread over 4 different skate parks. You start with a certain number of tickets and each allows you entry to one event in one of the skate parks and is expended upon entry. You can gain additional ones by earning points, which you do by skating the best way anyone has ever skated. Whenever you're not in an event, a bar counts down time until the arrival of Swarm of Bees. Once they arrive, you still have a very little time to get to the park to the next event. If you don't manage to do so, they catch you and the game ends. When competing in the parks, you earn points and money. The latter can be used to upgrade your equipment and to reset the timer. That said, you should try to do as many stunts as you can, even outside of the parks, to earn points for the tickets as they're not an unlimited resource. The events that you'll be participating in are The Ramp, where you perform tricks in a halfpipe Downhill, a long course where you race for speed navigating various slopes and banks Slalom, which kinda explains itself in its obvious naming, and finally Jump, where you jump off a series of ramps attempting to hit a bullseye that's off-screen. 720 degrees is definitely interesting if you're into the sport at least a little. It's not really a game for me though. Abyss is an abstract action puzzler that takes place on platforms floating in the air. The aim of the game is to deliver diamond-shaped thingies into the grey circles with yellow animated rings in them. It is easier said than done, however, as not only there are various environmental obstacles and puzzles to deal with, but also enemies that actively try to push you off the platforms. The obstacles that you'll face are quite varied and can range from barriers and holes through water to mines among others. If you fall off the platform, you lose one of your 10 lives. Why are there 10 of these? Because the game knows that it's difficult. Theoretically it's only 4 levels, but learning all the tropes, figuring out what switches do and where takes time, and Abyss is not an easy fair, so completing it will definitely take a lot of it. Time, that is. Accolade Comics is an action-adventure that's very unusual and really unlike anything at the time. You play as wisecracking secret agent Steve Keen. The game is partly choose-your-own-adventure presented in the pages of a comic book where you read the story, make decisions and often interact with other characters. Intertwined with action elements where you have to take control of Steve directly to overcome an action segment or two. You have two cases to follow through, both equally odd and quirky. First is the disappearance of a famous professor and second the mystery of strange self-replicating non-functioning fire hydrants. If you make the wrong choice in the comic panels or fail in one of the arcade sections, you may lose a life. If that happens, the game rewinds your story a few pages back, forcing you to redo a couple of pages before giving you a chance to approach what killed you again. Despite being very novel, Accolades Comics gameplay loop may not be everyone's cup of tea. I like it though. The graphics are unquestionably of high quality and full of detail in those larger panels. The humor too spills from all pages like a maple syrup spills from your waffles, so if you like comic books, funny games or adventures, this one's definitely not to miss. Ace 2 is a bit controversial. While the first Ace was a single-player air combat simulator heavily based on missions that needed to be completed in it, the second seemed to place all its eggs in a multiplayer basket. And while in theory it could be played alone, I wouldn't recommend it as it's just boring. But if you have someone else to play it against, it's pretty fun as a dogfight simulator where you and a friend get to relieve all those Top Gun moments on your C64. Other than that, it's an average fare, definitely not as good as the first title was. 
Airborne Ranger is divided into several smaller missions of various objectives, ranging from capturing enemy officers, destroying bunkers, to taking out some installations and rescuing captured POWs. The most unique feature of it though is easily its mission randomizer. Each map, objective and location is assigned randomly at the start of the mission, so no two are the same, which obviously adds a lot to the replayability and was not something seen in gaming often back then. Despite the simple graphics, Airborne Ranger was actually quite realistic for the time. At the beginning of each mission, after briefing, you could airdrop ammo in three freely chosen spots on the map, then you parachuted in the area and after completing your main objective, have to get to the pickup point within a time limit. Toasty! Alternate Reality The Dungeon is a follow-up to year prior's The City. Both games, Ariel and this outing, could be summarized as fantasy role-playings, but that would be a disservice to them. They were in fact so ahead of the time in their underlying concepts and their design that the only thing holding them back was the technology that could not fully realize what the creators imagined. Also, probably why the next three planned games in the series never saw the light of the day. The game starts directly after the first one ended and you're still held captive by aliens in an alternate reality of medieval fantasy-like times. You're trying to get through the massive in size and scope dungeon viewed from a first-person perspective and develop your character on the way. Stores, Inn and Smithy are still available for you to access like in previous game, but this time you can also join any of the six guilds that have made it inside the dungeon too. The dungeon is filled with various monsters to the brim and the combat is still turn-based. Alternate reality the dungeon is very challenging initially and requires a little time and patience investment to get better and not feel like a weakling in a hive full of killer bees. Unlike in previous game in the dungeon all items have their weight, so you can't be a limitless carrying mule as much as a warrior anymore. While Dungeon allows for importing of your character from the first game, there's hardly any incentive to do so other than the familiarity with it, as it's not imported as it was when you finished the first title, but in much reduced form. If you enjoy deep role-playing experiences, captivating stories and very well thought out combat system, this is a perfect game for you to just pick up and play. Apollo 18 Mission to the Moon is a fictional Mission to Moon simulator. It's your current Kerbal Space program but more serious and as simulationy as 6502 CPU allows it to be. And yes, I'm aware of the fact that there's no such word as simulationy, but it fits here and I'm not gonna retract it. If you expect action and blood pressure raising moments here, skip to another title in this video, Apollo is another game of speed. It requires both patience and skill, with a touch of precision to succeed. The game was beyond complex to my young self, especially that I'm not a native English speaker, and back then I was a broken English reader at best. That said, if you're an adult, as you are watching this video, and I know it for a fact that you are because I can see in my YouTube studio backend who watches this, the game is within the realm of completion. If you give it your best, approach it few times, you should be able to pull it off. And it's worth it, because even outside of excellent for the time speech synthesis, Apollo 18 feature impressive mixed resolution graphics, with some elements of the screen displayed in clearly higher fidelity than others. It's a technical trickery that hardly any devs used, and it's one that in hands of talented people could really raise overall quality or presentation of any game it is applied to. While you may fail more often than not playing Apollo 18, that one time, when you finally get it right, will be well worth all the trouble. In the very first years of home gaming not many titles could compete with popularity of Pong and then a bit later on Tetris. Two arcade titles most definitely could, Pac-Man and Arkanoid. Arkanoid seemed to be ported to everything under the sun in the late 80s and grand majority of those conversions were very good. C64 outing is no different. It sports all arcade stages, music and sounds are of very high quality and it looks as good as it's possible on Commodore's small system. I'm not a huge fan of controls though, as arcade trackball does not convert well to joystick. I mean, gameplay is fine, but it could have been much better with a mouse. It would make those split-second decisions and near-death saves actually possible. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't know how to play Arkanoid, especially anyone watching this video, but on an odd chance I'm wrong. In short, you've got to bounce progressively faster moving ball with the paddle that's at the bottom to clear all the blocks from the top of the screen. While doing so, you pick up various power-ups that make the task easier. It's hella fun, if you don't know it, look it up, track it down and play it. That's it. If there ever was an unusual and innovative title, the Armageddon Man is just that. The game takes place in back then far off future of 2032, when the world's 16 major superpowers formed an alliance to prevent a nuclear war catastrophe. You, as a titular Armageddon Man, are in control of satellite systems that are the only means of upholding the world peace. So, you have three SDI satellites that can be used to shoot off any nuclear missiles and you decide when and where they go. You can also spy on radio transmissions between the countries to figure out who the aggressor or potential victim may be, 
so that you'd know how to react. There are also messages and requests that the nations will send to you periodically, and the way you respond to them will influence global stability. Nations differ in technological advancement, military power and resources, so all that along with the information you gather using earlier mentioned means are your clues on what to do to prevent the nuclear Armageddon. I don't think there's been a similar futuristic pre-apocalyptic political simulation released before, and this may very well be the first one. So if you're interested, make sure to give it a spin. Monty is back again, with equally as odd and crazy scheme as before. Since you managed to escape to the rocky Gibraltar in the previous title, Monty on the Run, one would think that you would enjoy your freedom. But that's hardly the case. Intermol Agency, yes, you heard that right, Intermol, so Intermol Agency is on your tail and once more you need to escape. Your best bet, your final idea for freedom, is to trek across Europe collecting cash until you have enough to purchase Greek island of Montos and live there forever and ever in luxury and security. Story aside, our video design Monty is still an action platformer this time however with some screens representing famous European landmarks, like an Eiffel Tower or Leaning Tower of Pisa. The levels are full of ladders and bouncy platforms and are as fun as they've always been. Monty can finally fall off the platform without being hurt, but water is still something to be wary of. There's plenty collectibles in each of the screens, with Eurochecks being the most important pickups, as they can be exchanged for money and airplane tickets. While all Monty games are pretty playable, the graphics did not improve much and to me it still looks as if it was converted straight from ZX Spectrum. I realize that it's not the case as there's a lot of colors mixed in small areas and that would cause some serious color clash on Spectrum, but graphics plainness makes me feel otherwise. I just can't help it. Bangkok Nights is a game that always had me baffled as a kid. It released in 1987 and by 1993 1994 I was wondering why C64 never received a Street Fighter 2 port. I mean, the sprites in Bangkok Nights were huge, so clearly this could not be an issue. Now, little did I know that there was a Street Fighter port 2 on Commodore's Micro, but that's story for another video, as it was something else. Anyway, Bangkok Nights is a versus fighting game although it's probably more accurate to call it a Muay Thai simulator. The goal of the game is to defeat all the different in-design opponents in various settings, so that you could gain access to the famous Lupin Stadium and meet the legendary Bangkok Knights there. Now, while in reality Muay Thai is one of the fastest and most brutal fighting styles out there, in a game it doesn't feel anything like it. It's not very fast and limited in the array of moves you can perform. That said, it's fun for a couple of fights, especially if you have someone to play it with, and features beautiful graphics. Nicely detailed backgrounds, the biggest sprites you'll see on C64, and Rob Hubbard's soundtrack. It's a treat. Barbarian is quite fun game when played against a friend, and easily the most brutal and bloody versus fighter of the 80s. While playing you can actually feel the weight of attacks, and head chopping finisher is very enjoyable way of highlighting your unquestionable dominance over a defeated opponent. In single player, however, Barbarian gets old quick. It's essentially a series of virtually identical fights that don't innovate in any way over multiplayer, meaning the only difference is you're fighting against considerably more stupid opponent. All that said, Barbarian is still an important title as it was one of the first few decent versus fighting games on the system. And even though it's not groundbreaking in any way, with no fiery special moves or explosive projectiles like games of the next decade would have in abundance, it's a fun favorite and one worth having a go at with a friend. What can be said about battleships? Well, it's probably the best reimagination of a pen and paper classic on a home system. It can be played either with a friend or against the CPU. Obviously, some changes had to be made to make the game more cinematic, for the lack of a better word, and more involving. So the game field is considerably bigger than your classical 10x10. It's 20 by 20 in fact, and there's six ships only, each different in size and having more Tetris-like shapes. But wait, that's not all. Each of your ships, as long as it's still afloat, gets to shoot four times per round. So you start with as many as 24 shots in first round. It keeps the game moving at fast pace, while keeping interactivity relatively high too. So, it's good to fire a wide spread all around the game board in the first one or two rounds, hoping to hit something. And then when you do, focus on singular ships. All firing rounds are accompanied by animation sequences, which while being quite neat, get old fast. All in all, Battleships is pretty fun, especially against a friend, which is not something you'd expect coming from this very basic in its design pen and paper classic. Batty is one of the best Arkanoid slash breakout clones out there. The basic principle is the same, you're controlling a paddle at the bottom of the screen, bouncing off the ball to destroy the bricks arranged in various patterns at the top of it. Destroying all bricks allows you to move to the next level, and there's a whopping 64 of these in the game. 
As in most games in the very narrow genre, there's a lot of pickups that can make the challenge easier, and there are double shot, comet passing through bricks, and larger, multi ball, and jump to the next level, to name a few of the available ones. There's also a magnet thingy in the middle of the screen in some levels that activates every few seconds, influencing the direction of the ball's movement. All those features make Trident Estet Arcanoid formula fresh, and while in theory it's more of the same, but it doesn't get old and is fun to play even today. Especially that I haven't mentioned its biggest and best feature yet. A feature that sadly will not be shown in this video, as I have no one here with me and couldn't find appropriate video of it on YouTube. But Batty can be played in simultaneous cooperative multiplayer, where each of the players have their own paddle and their own side of the screen to play on. It is honestly one of the most fun multiplayer experiences you can have on C64. An evil warlock Zagrim rules with an iron fist over otherwise peaceful land of Marigold. After centuries of suffering, people need a hero. Someone who will take it upon himself to rid the land of Marigold, its cruel ruler. Since I'm talking to you and you're watching the video, I think it's obvious who the hero will be. You. Yes, I know you've got things planned and you were hoping to do nothing throughout the rest of the day, but have mercy, man. Will you allow people of Marigold to suffer? They need you, and there's no one else. I have an appointment and gotta go, but you, you can do it. Black Magic is a tale of courageous adventurer on a quest to defeat Zagrin, all in a side-scrolling action game with some superficial role-playing elements. As you progress through the land, cleaning it of Zagrim's scam monsters, you'll earn experience points and in time will level up and get promoted. First to wizard, then sorcerer, and eventually necromancer, a class required to defeat the warlock. On your travels you learn new spells and they will be crucial in final encounter with the villain. I'm sorry, what? You're saying that I should have led with you becoming a necromancer? That that would have convinced you straight away? Well, I suppose it's good that you agreed to free those who suffer, right? But on the other hand, it leaves a bit of a bad aftertaste that I had to convince you with a promise of an enormous power you'll obtain along the way. Honestly, I don't know how to feel about you anymore. So I'll just leave it be and move to another game. The biggest issue I have with BMX Kids is that it's only single player. Sure, it's fun and all, but it would have been so much better with a friend. Or friends. I shouldn't really kid myself here, plural is hardly a case these days when it comes to C64 games. At least for myself. Anyway, BMX Kids is a side-scrolling arcade BMX racer, where you're conquering six obstacle courses on your bike in a race against the clock. To proceed to the next track, you have to perform a certain number of stunts and wheelies in given time against five other opponents. Doing so, however, depletes your energy, which you have to refill picking up cans spread all over the tracks. Some stunts will cause you to damage your bike, it can too, however, be fixed by picking up the replacement wheels along the way. The game ends when you fail to qualify to the next race, or when you've no more spare spokes left. BMX Kids was a budget title, but given how fun it could have been in multiplayer, I believe that if the option was added, it could have easily been a full price game. Combat School, aka Bootcamp, is a, believe it or not, despite the title, a multi-event sports game for one or two players. Sure, it's themed as if you were a cadet in a military school, but for all intents and purposes, it doesn't differ much from any other multi-discipline game. The events are Assault Truck, where your marine runs and jumps through obstacles, Firing Range, where 35 targets must be hit within given time limit, then there's an Iron Man, where you swim or canoe over treacherous terrain, after that, there's firing range again, this time you're shooting robotic tanks. And that is followed by the arm wrestling competition. And third and final firing range with a mixture of normal and innocent targets. And last but not least, is a hand-to-hand -hand fight with your instructor, which to be completed needs to be won in a set time. While I actually enjoy combat school for what it is, I would have preferred if there was only one firing range and the other two would be replaced with some other new disciplines. But that's me. Bop and Rumble aka Street Hustle is anything but politically correct. Street Hustle is a side-scrolling beat-em-up where you fight against any manner of unusual for the genre set of characters. From old folks with canes, through gorillas, dogs and beer belly guys to little people. And anything in between. While it may have not been released today, Street Hustle is actually chock full of dark humor. All the enemies are full of character and behave in an odd and often unusual way. Your set of moves is also quite funny, with likes of rubbing someone's ears or kicking them in the balls, being something you'll do often. It's a fun game, no doubt about that, but I question its longevity and appeal to anyone over 10 years old. I mean, it feels at times as it's entirely made out of comic relief moments and characters with no substance underneath. I don't mind it from time to time, but it's not something I would be actively seeking out to play. Speed Buggy originated in the arcades, from which it was quickly translated into any and all means of home gaming hardware. C64 Sport, while a victim of quite drastic graphical downgrade as compared to the original, retained all of its fun and playability. Simply put, it's a race against time for points. 
There's no real opponents to speak of and you have to complete the race while gathering as many of those sweet sweet points as you can. And you do so by grabbing colored flags and if you get all colors you'll get an additional 1000 points. There's also three types of gates to drive through, worth respectively 100, 250 and 500 points. There's also an occasional soccer ball worth 2000 and there are time gates that extend your time by extra 2 seconds upon completion of a leg of a race. The game is composed out of 5 tracks, one being a circuit and the other 4 sprints. They're all pretty varied and fun, featuring bridges, tunnels and are chock full of different obstacles like locks, boulders and fences. All those terrain features reduce your remaining time, so it's not hard to guess that they have to be avoided. Well, unless you're gunning for the lowest possible score, then by all means aim right at them. I was never a huge fan of Buggy Boy, but I completely understand its appeal and why people love it, so can wholeheartedly recommend it, even if it's not really my juice box. California Games is an extreme sports themed title in Epix's series of sports games and a direct follow up to Summer and Winter Games. Same as the real titles, California Games is a collection of few individual sporting events, in this case it's skateboarding, footback, surfing, roller skating, frisbee and BMX. After each attempt you're scored by a group of judges. The biggest appeal of the game however is its multiplayer mode where up to 8 players can compete on a single computer. And I don't have to say, I believe that the more the merrier applies here perfectly. Anyway, California Games gained critical acclaim upon its release which secured the game a later sequel. While California Games released on most systems on the market at the time, this C64 outing was always my favorite. It's hard to tell why, but my best bet is familiarity. After all, C64 was my first system and that's where I played California Games first. This concludes the first episode of 1987 C64 Gaming. And it's just scratching the surface, cause it looks like there's gonna be 3 or 4 more for the year before I cover everything important that premiered on the system. What do you think about those first few? Any of your faves here? Let me know. Make sure to subscribe not to miss the release of the next video. 70% of you are not subscribed, so you may never be sure if YouTube decides to send my video your way. Even better, if you hit the bell, new videos will not only land in your subs box, but you'll also get a short and friendly notification when they're there. So think about it. If you'd like to support this channel grow, I'd appreciate both Patreon and YouTube memberships. All the support I get helps me release better content and I work towards replacing my editing PC. Members get access to my new videos a day early and are always in the loop on what I plan to release, change, introduce, etc. But if you can't or don't want to do that, likes and subscribes are great too. Most of all, however, I would like to thank all the YouTube Let's Play and Playthrough creators, from whose videos short bits were taken for this one as a video background to my commentary. You'll find all their names linked into their channels in the description below. They're amazing and thanks to their efforts retro community can prevail for years longer and in better form than it could have otherwise. So thank you. For me though this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.